So hello and good morning. It is indeed quite a bit early here. Um, I hope uh, the meeting has been going well on your side. Um, okay, so let me quickly introduce myself. Um, Tim and I work on the same, um, in the same team. Uh, my name is Eugen Kim with the UN Human Rights Office based in Geneva. I'm working alongside my colleague Tim here on issues pertaining to human rights and digital technologies. Um, we are part of a tech and human rights team here at the UN, Gene UN Human Rights Office in Geneva, and we cover a broad range of issues pertaining to, uh, to this, including privacy, AI, internet shutdowns, and connectivity, um, border tech for expression, discrimination, just to name a few of our portfolios. Great. So who are we? Uh, what do we do is exactly, right? Uh, so the UN, UN Human Rights Office is part of the UN Secretariat. Uh, we're headquartered here in Geneva. We have an office in New York City. Uh, we also have uh, various presences in the regions and, and on country levels around the world. Um, I'll keep it short for the purpose of our presentation. Um, so we are the leading UN entity on human rights. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, we represent the global commitment to the promotion and protection of the full range of human rights and freedoms. Uh, we play a central role in advocating for human rights globally. And we support states and other stakeholders, including businesses, in upholding and promoting human rights. And we are within the entire UN system. We're tasked to mainstream human rights. And in recent years, the human rights implications of digital tech um, which really cut across all sectors and increasingly all parts of our lives and societies have become a key component of our work here at the UN Human Rights Office. So let me quickly outline our work in this area. Um, as an office, we have certainly considered this issue, but it wasn't until the Human Rights Council passed a resolution in 2021 titled New and Emerging Digital Technologies and Human Rights which gave us the mandate to formally work in this area. So the Human Rights Council asked our office to convene an expert consultation and write a report on the relationship between human rights and technical standard setting processes for new and emerging digital technologies. And since then, we organized an expert meeting uh, last February, uh, where we convened experts from diverse stakeholder groups, including civil society, academia, private sector and standard setting organizations. And building on our desk research and the expert consultation in February, we presented our report on this topic to the Human Rights Council in June of last year. And since then we have presented our report and key findings of our report to a variety of audiences, including at the World Standards, Standards Congress, um, at the Internet Engineering Task Force, and more recently um, in collaboration with the AI Standards Hub at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, we've also done um, a webinar with the Internet Telecommunications Union um, last December. So now that I've given a quick overview of the work of our office in this area, let me dive right into uh, the human rights impacts of standards. So let me begin by saying that the standards are more than technicalities. Um, they can either protect or enable violations of human rights. Um, for example, take standards that define encryption properties, um, which is crucial for privacy, for safeguarding privacy, safeguarding for expression, as well as security, liberty, and fair trial. Um, more specifically, standard proposals, which would introduce a backdoor to encrypted technology can facilitate surveillance and privacy abuses, which can in turn impact a range of rights, um, as I mentioned, um, such as freedom of expression, security, fair trial, and belief. Um, perhaps another example is the domain name system, which uh, by its design can make a prominent example of blocking access to websites and services online. So I should also note that there are broader types of standards, uh, such as foundational terminology and management standards that lay out organizational processes. Um, so indeed, there are standards beyond technical specification that have implications for human rights and sometimes directly address uh, human rights concerns. 
An example of this is accessibility standards of digital tools and services for persons with disabilities. Uh, for, for instance, uh, the W3C has accessibility standards um, that has made it um, what made the web more accessible for um, people with disabilities. And lastly, I should note that human rights cannot always be hard coded into standards. Um, so a lot actually also depend on how implement how standards are implemented. Um, so in addition to looking at how standards are designed and developed um, and elaborated, um, there's a need to look at how standards are implemented. So having uh, yeah. said that, now over to you, Tim. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you, Eugene. Um, yeah, we thought. I might interject just for, for a moment to, to, to explain what the added values of um, taking, uh, looking at standards uh, through human rights lens. Um, why are we doing it um, this way? Um, often we, we, we face um, ethical approaches. We hear a lot about tech for good and uh, uh, similar terminology. And while all this is, is perfectly valid, and I know and we see uh, the good intentions and the good work behind it, um, what I felt was uh, hopefully useful for you is to highlight a few points. What if we look through human rights lens, uh, how that can really contribute to um, um, developing. Um, better tech and better standards. So to start with, it's an established framework. It's something the world has worked with for uh, many decades. It incorporates universally uh, accepted and agreed values. Um, we can rely on a broad set, but clearly or relatively clearly defined um, rights that really center people, center what they uh, uh, should enjoy in terms of rights. And that in turn um, helps us clearly identify um, duties, responsibilities, and identify what harms we need to focus on, what harms need to be addressed, what harms need to be prevented. Um, and over the decades of, of working uh, with human rights, law, principles, standards, um, the very nuanced language has developed, um, lots of methodologies, um, the way of assessing and weighing positions, the principles underlying that. Speaking of human rights due diligence and human rights impact assessments, principles such as necessity, proportionality, um, legality, accountability, etc. And all this is embedded in, a, in an institutional framework. Um, we have national institutions, we have regional institutions, international, global institutions. Courts apply human rights uh, law, use human rights language, and again, contribute to a nuanced understanding of what human rights mean. And um, so if done well, human rights law, human rights principle standards can really contribute so much to developing standards we believe uh, would be fully fit for purpose. Thanks, Eugene, over to you. Thanks, Tim. Um, that was wonderful. Great. Um, so let me, uh, having said, you know, the added value of the human rights framework, um, maybe it's, it's useful for us to really um, look at some of the challenges that exist um, from the find from the um, from what we found. Um, to to begin, you know, there is um, this generalized views. Um, I think you know, I think the landscape or you know, there's a diversity of standard setting organizations. Um, and the breadth um, of the different um, kind of standards that they work on and perhaps different procedures, um, operational procedures and structures uh, in terms of membership and otherwise 
um, I think having this generalized views of, of what what they are um, isn't uh, quite helpful, right? I think uh, you know different standard organizations have good practices. Uh, in, in one area, there's there's certainly been some best practices. Um, so just taking a more um, nuanced approach, um, I think is a, perhaps a good starting point. And um, within uh, standard setting organizations, what we found is that um, I think over the, you know, if you look at the history of st standard setting, for example, um, it's largely been driven by a lot of the technical experts. Um, but given that now, for for examples, when we talk about standards on around artificial intelligence um, systems, for example, uh, we see that really there needs to be a, a lot more diversity, thematic diversity, in in terms of the inputs and in terms of the, the consultations, um, because of the impact that it has on society, on human rights, on the full range of human rights. Um, so I, I would say that within, um, you know, the lack of thematic diversity is a challenge. Um, and to date, you know, there's no, not yet um, a mandatory human rights due diligence or impact assessment, uh, no systemic impact monitoring of different standards that are developed and then also implemented. Um, and some we found to be active resist, actively resistant to human rights for various reasons. Um, and when it comes to uh, the inputs that you know inform standards, um, there certainly has been a lack of breadth of inputs. For example, uh, we note the gender gap in terms of participation in standard setting uh, fora. Um, the fact that English um, most of the time is the dominant language. And what does that mean in terms of global participation when we discuss technologies um, that do um, pertain to um, various populations. Um, there certainly is a prevailing culture in different standard setting organizations, um, which may um, which may exclude um, others, uh, perhaps uh, non-technical stakeholders or those that are new in participating um, in, in, or around standard setting itself. Um, I should note that um, if we take a global approach, there certainly is the standardization gap um, with Global South, um, countries from the Global South, um, businesses based in the Global South dramatically are underrepresented in um, standard setting for us. Um, I would say same goes for small and medium sized enterprises when it comes to their participation. Um, part of it is really the, the cost, um, the, the, you know, the lack of human resources and the, uh, really it's a resource issue as well as um, uh, perhaps a knowledge gap. Um, around certain standards, there certainly has been some geopolitical dimension and tension. Um, but having noted all of these challenges, um, I just say that um, there is some certainly some progress and there is certainly movement. Um, there is growing awareness among various standard setting organizations, as well as participants and those active in standard setting processes of the importance of human rights. Um, notably, um, at the W3C, the ethical web principles of the W3C's technical architecture group um, stated that we need to put internationally recognized human rights at the core of the web platform. And I believe that it is the web principles, um, the ethical web principles are, um, uh, I quote to, um, are based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And over to you, Tim. Thank you, Eugene. Um, in, in, indeed, um, W3C um, has, when we were working on, on, on our report, um, given us various very good examples of, of how to approach things. So, so kudos uh, to you and that uh, we hope we can uh, keep building on this. So the question, how do we um, address these challenges? And I, I, I'd like to repeat again uh, what, what Eugene said. Um, we've taken a generalized view. We had a very uh, broad mandate to look at the entire uh, technical standard setting landscape. Um, what's important to keep in mind is there's no, no magic switch. There's nothing uh, that can be done that um, magically uh, solves all the problems of 
participation, of transparency, of incentives, etc. Um, but so what it means is there needs to be a certain shift in culture uh, among many participants, among um, uh, standards set setting uh, more broadly. Um, technical standards should not be understood as, mere, as merely technical, although, of course, they, at their core, solve technical problems. We completely understand that. But what also needs to be seen that they're embedded in complex social, economic, and political fabrics. They impact on societies, communities, um, and individuals uh, need to be really the guiding themes of standards development. It's fundamental to put people and their rights at the center of processes. What does that mean? Standard setting organizations and their participants, they should commit to the application of human rights using uh, human rights methodologies and um, also uh, to being accountable uh, for implementing this. Um, in particular, it's important that these commitments are driven um, by the senior level organizations. Um, making human rights a reality means carrying out systematic assessments of human rights risks and the impact of the standards. Um, we've seen very good practice of screening mechanisms, uh, for example, uh, within W3C. Um, real life impacts of standards, how they are eventually implemented and used should be monitored. That's not easy at all, but it's necessary to see how things evolve and to identify what needs to be done in the future. Um, appeals mechanisms um, can be a useful tool um, if uh, things have uh, possibly gone the wrong way. Um, access to information, uh, needs to be improved in many organizations. And we need strong proactive steps to increase inclusive participation, mentorship programs, um, contributions to uh, that ease the financial burden, fee waivers, financial, direct financial support, um, uh, the collection of, 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 of data, of working documents proactive um, seeking of inputs from the public. Um, all that said, we would like to turn the table around and ask you what your reflections are on what we said, how you see from your own practice, from your daily work within uh, the, uh, the W3C, what main problems are you are facing and how you are approaching these and what kind of solutions you have found. Um, Eugene, do you want to add anything? Otherwise, I would really like to ask everyone else, uh, everyone in the room um, or online to um, share their thoughts and insights with us. Thank you. Nothing to add from my side, Tim. Love to hear from the, part the participants here today.